So, nine o'clock, and we would like to welcome all of you who are with us today on the webinar about satellite data business opportunities. We are so proud about our fantastic program today because we have managed to engage speakers from Sweden and from the UK who are very experienced in this business and they will share a lot of tips and tricks with us, their experience. They will talk about the business in a general way, first of all, so that we will get into the right mood. We will get some inspirational talk about, about the digital twin. Uh, and uh, we will listen to two different cases and how they have been able to develop a business idea from satellite data. We have representatives from uh, the satellite application Catapult. They have, they, two of them have been working there, are, are now alumni. And one will talk about the general picture. The other one will talk about a new startup. We also have rep a representative from CGI and one from the Swedish company Vultus. And at the very end of this presentation, we will hear our own colleague uh, talk about the SME program that we are offering to SMEs in this region. SMEs, small and medium sized companies who are interested in the satellite data business and also would like to, to learn more about this. You could say that this webinar is like an introduction to the coming program. And those of you who are interested, we will have an information slot at the end in, in Swedish and we will talk more about that. Uh, just some practical details. We, will, um, we have video and, and mics on for those speaking. Everybody else can be active in the chat if you have questions, for instance, or would like to share something during the presentations, that is fine. And then we will uh, try to, to, uh, to catch up some of the questions in the panel at, at the end or just before we talk about the, the satellite program. So I think I forgot to say who I am. I am Johanna bergström Roos, and uh, let's see if I can, uh, if I can, no, I cannot, but maybe Emma can switch to the next. Thank you. Uh, I, I am running this program, RIT, RIMD för Innovation och Tillväxt, which is Space for Innovation and Growth in, in English. Uh, we have been doing this for five years, building up the ecosystem around the space business in this region. Uh, now we have been very much focusing on, on hardware, on techniques in space. Of course, we are very near to the S-Range Space Center. So that has been a lot of our focus, but also other Swedish companies are in this program. Here you can see who. It's operated by the Luleå University of Technology and LTU Business, where I work. But also we have the incubator with us. We have a space science institute. We have different space, uh, Swedish space companies involved. And uh, the sponsors at the bottom, you can see this is an EU regional fund project. So if we take the, the next slide, I will just very short present the, the, the program for today. Could you do that, Emma, for me? Thank you. Uh, and as you see, we have a rather tight schedule. There will be around 12 minutes presentations, 15 and 12 minutes. And then we will uh, have a short break until we take the two, the two, the, the last one before the panel. So. I guess that we have the picture quite clear for us right now. So what I would like to do is to introduce our first speaker and also welcome him to this webinar. It will be Richard Hilton, who is uh, from the Satellite at, uh, Application Catapult in the UK. Used to be there, but now has taken the step to uh, develop his own company together with Steve, who will talk later on. So he's also the CEO of the, of the company Global Trust. But this first presentation will be all about the fantastic catapult program that the UK are running to inspire and to get this business up and running, you could say. So very welcome, Richard. You will talk about space data ex exploitation and expected business opportunities in the future. Thank you, Johanna. 
Um, can I see my slides? We, we will share them for you so that you can so that you can click yourself. That is the plan. Mm -hmm. We were just talking about how, how everybody has been become experts in, in these tools, having yeah, Richard, webinars. Richard, you are now controlling the screen. Okay. So you can just click. There we go. Okay, there great, thank you. All right, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you guys today. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a privilege to be here, partly um, because um, I, I'm very passionate about the subject that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, it links directly to the work that I've been doing pretty much all my career now. Um, so uh, this, this is something which is close to my heart, but also partly because of the link to the Norbotten region as well. Um, so Global Trust itself, I, I'm speaking here with two hats on, as Johanna said. Um, I, I am the CEO of Global Trust, which is a company that has sprung out of actually an investment by various partners in the Norbotten region um, through the Global Watch um, program, which many of you may be aware of. So it was that program which led me to talk to SSC um, and then the idea of the Global Trust company was born. So uh, Steve will be talking more about the company. And as, as Johanna said, I'm really here to talk about um, the role of well, not really the role, the, the, the kind of innovation landscape and the various trends in, in markets and the sort of lessons that we've learned from being at the catapult and trying to stimulate um, a country's space economy. Um, so if I, if I, what I'll do through my presentation here is to talk a little bit first about some of the, uh, the market trends um, that we've seen. Um, I'm going to show you some slides which you'll see are branded as catapult and that's because they were from a study which I was leading a few years ago. Um, they're slightly out of date and you have to remember that because COVID has been such a disruptive thing, we, we might have to slightly deviate from, from what I'm going to show you, but hopefully these are useful um, top level um, trends in, in the market. What I'm not going to do is do your business development for you. So what I'm going to do is just give you some guidance about where this might go. The second thing is for me to talk a little bit about the technology, um, where that is going, the developments that um, if, you're, if you're thinking about building a business in this space, what, what you should be considering. And then the third thing I wanted to quickly show you is it's all very well having those things within your own organization, but actually having a wider ecosystem of things um, around you is incredibly powerful. And I'll try and highlight some of the, the things that would uh, really assist anybody that's thinking of starting up a business. So I think I can probably skip over this. You can see the three logos here and I'm happy to talk to you after this uh, about any, anything on any of those organizations. So the opportunities themselves. Um, I think that the, one of the main key takeaways I'd like to give you is really that um, whilst people tend to put themselves into a single technology area, um, the reality is when it comes to a business proposition, it's almost impossible to, to consider these technologies in isolation. And the best applications, the most successful, the most sustainable applications will really come through a blend of one or more of these technologies, usually more, um, and almost certainly in conjunction with information data systems that the client already has. So it's very tempting to just focus down on your particular area of interest. But actually, if we're talking about business proposition, it's much more useful to think far wider than that. And so what I'm going to do is just go through some examples to show you, show you how, that, how that's true. And, and hopefully this will just stimulate some thinking about your own work. So I mentioned um, a report I, I commissioned a few years ago. I, I used a company called Bryce, um, who are a very capable um, consultancy based in the US, but they have offices in Europe as well. And really what I'm showing here are just three main areas. I'm not going to read all the words here, um, but the, the, the main point is that the ability for people to connect to anything from anywhere and actually get information as fast as they can and make decisions upon it is just becoming so ubiquitous in everyday life for us as citizens, but also for businesses that it, it means that the use of um, novel communication technologies to get data to and from remote areas is critical, but how you fuse that into networks which are in cities, in cars, in airports, in wherever it might be, uh, and that, that fusion is, is, is critical. Uh, and we're seeing this through a lot of the large programs, but I think it becomes more and more um, important to do this, not just within a developed country like the UK or Sweden, but actually to do this anywhere in the world. 
And as, as and many of you will know, there are big initiatives to try and get the first steps of large constellations to deliver broadband to very remote areas anywhere in the world. The second part here is more about the digitalization and digitalization of companies. Um, the ability to move away from paper-based um, activities, the ability to really remove the need to have a human go and do certain things um, by putting sensors, making measurements in difficult to reach places, in places where it might be dangerous or very expensive to have people operating and actually then start making um, sense of this data, which is the third point. When you've got all these sensors in place, no matter what your context is, how do you actually make the most and best use of all of that data that's available to you? And I've seen examples in the past where in certain parts of the world, they have, for instance, built a bridge and covered it with sensors and all of that data goes into a control room somewhere and nothing is done with it. So really focusing on the use case, what the problem is that you're trying to solve and applying the best of the technologies in each of these three areas is always going to be key. That, that initial challenge um, definition is always going to be a core part of what we need to do here. Moving on slightly, um, the other two areas I wanted to mention was, was sustainability and once again, the digitalization piece. These affect all sectors. So these are cross sector trends. Sustainability is something which we've seen growing over the last probably 20 years, 15 years maybe, but really accelerating incredibly fast in the last five years to the point where every company that's publicly listed, pretty much every private company in general will be having strategies to ensure that their operations are as sustainable as possible. And that means many things, of course, and there's a whole set of industries that are there to support other companies reach their sustainability goals and define them. But the, the, the global reach, the independent view the satellites give uh, means that they're actually an incredibly good tool to help some of these larger companies. And that's actually one of the main reasons why we've created the Global Trust Company that Steve will talk about later. So if I move on from here now. So which are the markets? Um, the study that I commissioned, um, it looked at every single market in the world. Um, it was a very top-down um, study. Um, and what we did there was to try and not just measure the size of the industry, because that can be done quite simply. There are lots of people writing reports on, on global markets, but it tried to say which market areas actually had an obvious link to space technologies, be that the use of geospatial data, geospatial intelligence, or whether it's much more linked to the, the ability to provide communication skills anywhere in the world. And what you're seeing here is a snapshot of how those markets looked back in 2017. So it's a few years out of date, but. The trends are probably pretty true today. And the, I guess the key thing here is what you'll see is it's very skewed um, um, towards the certain markets at the top here. And if I overlay the next area, what, what you'll see is those top markets are the ones which are largely linked to the communication um, side of things. So the first one, media, it's, it's satellites to terrestrial um, television broadcast and, and other such services. But the ones in red are actually the ones where the geospatial intelligence comes in, the satellite imagery, the sensors on the ground, more than the other markets. So they're small today, but these are growing markets. And because of the change in technology, what we're seeing is that those should be accelerating increasingly fast from this point onwards. So what you'll see here actually in this list in the red boxes are markets which are typically very untapped by today's space sector. There's lots of financial services in there. Things like food producers. I'm not talking about the farming, I'm talking about the actual supermarkets and supply chains who are much more interested in the um, provenance of where the products are coming from and therefore they're having to take a global view. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight into some of the overall trends and, and where the markets are. I will be circulating these slides so you can read this data later and actually these reports should be openly published as well so we can probably send links to where you can collect those, those reports and read them. On the delivery side, to match up against the expectation, there's been an awful lot of change in the last uh, five to 10 years. And part of the, the Catapult's remit is to accelerate that. Um, it is broken down to these various sectors, and I won't be dwelling on all of these things, but really uh, it's worth considering that even though you may be interested in the area on the right, which is the geospatial data, the imagery, the, you know, the modeling, they're trying to actually create a solution for a person in the real world. The ability to do that depends on the things which are further up, up the value chain. So even things like the next generation of sensors coming out, which can really give you a valuable data set to then feed into your processing chain to sell to your client. 
So it's, it's definitely worth considering where these trends are going to make sure that your services are as up to date and powerful as they can be for your clients. So the key developments, I'm not gonna go through all of this. Um, there are three slides here, which look similar to this, but just to highlight the main, the main things we're talking about here, because technology has moved on and it hasn't always come from the space domain, but we can certainly take benefit from it. So the ability, as I've already mentioned several times now, to put sensors anywhere inside a factory, in, on a farm, in the middle of nowhere, in space, it doesn't really matter where they're coming from. We now have the ability to put sensors there, to power them, to collect the data, to send the data back and actually make use of it. But the ability to actually view data and interrogate data by your client or by you on behalf of your client is always going to be critical. There is no point in having a huge store of data, which is just impossible to make any sense of. So there is an opportunity, a really good opportunity to see how you can just present information in a way that makes a lot of sense to a decision maker. That's incredibly valuable. Moving across, we end up to the processing time. Okay, shorthand for advances in IT. Um, the ability now for people to tap into enormous data sets stored centrally by space agencies or even people like Amazon these days to be able to use cloud computing to create massive scale computing um, processing chains, which was impossible to dream of 10 years ago, and then to shut it down. So you don't have the ongoing burden of the cost of all that. All this changes the scope and scale of what we can do now. Moving onwards, there's an issue of doing this quickly, and there's no point in waiting several months to get an answer. But actually, this question of transparency and trust in data is increasingly important, especially with the sustainability agenda on us. We need to be able to see what has happened to our data, who has touched it, what changes have been made, and actually make sure that even when it says that, that you actually can believe through things like digital ledgers, distributed ledgers technology, that um, this, this hasn't been tampered with and isn't falsified. Those kind of issues are becoming increasingly important when we start talking about the issues which may end up having to be shown in a legal situation, for instance, if there's disputes. And then to move on quickly again, um, uh, the moving away from centralized control, actually having sensors at the edge, the satellites, the sensors in the field make decisions, actually have one sensor, one satellite, for instance, tasking another or swapping modes. So it can find holes in cloud and then take high resolution imagery through the gaps. Much richer set of data sets for us to be building upon. And just an example where most, many of these things have come together now, there is an initiative run by CEOS largely, but other agencies too, about trying to standardize um, imagery so that you can take data from any satellite and you can compare pixel to pixel across satellites and through time. So that means there is an issue of standards, there's an issue of getting the best science, there's an issue of actually scaling up the production. And then there's a question of how do you then implement this into a large IT system that people can then come and explore, download and um, extract the information they need from it. And if you can do that centrally, what that does, it means that people like yourselves perhaps who are interested in creating a data centric business, you just have to come in, tap into the cube and extract the bits that you want rather than bearing the burden of all the upstream pre-processing that's being done. And there are large initiatives underway to try and do this kind of work. And I'll show you an example of where the Catapult has done this in, in a minute. So the approach, and this is really where I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Catapult more and about the, the general ecosystem for innovation. So what we've done in the, in the UK is we've recognized that we have good universities, um, we have thriving industry, um, but there's often a gap between the two. Um, there is an organization called Innovate UK, um, which is there to provide some funding to try and bridge that gap. But actually what we recognized was needed was an entity or entities which would actually do something a little bit more practical on the ground and actually focus its attention on particular sectors. And the Catapult network, and there are 10 Catapults in that network, um, is, is that vehicle. And I and Steve were at the Satellite Applications Catapult, something created by the industry for the industry and funded by government as a not-for-profit entity. Its, its way of working is to do the three things you can see on the top right there, is to do a lot of communication with the end users, to teach them what space can do, to show them how space can solve their problems. It's there to work with supply chains so they can find where there are gaps in the technology. They can be introduced to new technologies they've never been made aware of and actually enrich their proposition. And then on the third point, the enabling business, is really recognizing that having the best technology in the world does not make a successful business. And we actually need to provide a lot of support to startups, 
to people that may have been spit out from universities, help them to attract funding and make sure their business model is robust. And between those three things, we believe that we've actually created a model which actually is proving successful. We've tried to focus it on four areas, and though the four areas I mentioned there were early on, they're slightly out of date now, but you can get the idea that actually we can't do this for every sector. We have to try and focus it on a few things, um, but although they are actually still quite broad, so you can probably fit most things under those things. The last area is the bit on the right, which was recognition that actually there are facilities that no one company would actually invest in, um, and it would be hard to justify investing uh, for the use of others. But if they could be made as national facilities, then companies will come along and use them on a kind of a rental basis. Come in, use it, solve the problem, and then move on, and then someone else can come in and use facilities. And so the catapult's been part of that and working with industry to make sure they don't replicate things and making sure there is actually a proper demand before the investments are made. So that's, that's what's going on there. Um, on the, on the, the, the UK map, what you can also see is this clustering effect. So we have created a bit of a space hub around the Harwell campus near Oxford. Um, but actually, we, we've never forgotten that there's an awful lot of power in the regions. And so we have created more local regional focused hubs out all around the UK, which can then talk to that central hub in Harwell and make sure the best of technology and the best opportunities are shared. I just want to talk a little bit about the approach taken here. And what we're really seeing is that um, technology is great, but it's only part of the solution. And really, there are three main stakeholders that need to be considered. One is the people with the knowledge of the technology. The person is the, another is the person who's going to be using the output from what you've created. And the third is actually the person that's either you as the owner of the business that's trying to serve that market, or it's your customer who is making decisions based upon the information you're telling them. And actually what you need to do is consider all of those things every time you design a solution and you build that into your business plan. And actually the world of user-centered design has actually proved incredibly powerful for us. And what this really does is it shows that you don't just need EO experts here. What you need is a, a quite a wide range of skills when you're creating these businesses, when you're creating these solutions. But what I'm hoping I can do with my last slide or second from last slide is, is really just to say that Whilst there is scope for business experts, industrial designers, environmental scientists, IT experts, data scientists, you don't have to recruit them all. There are a wide range of people out there, the networks such as the one we're, I guess we're talking to now, or we can call this a network. Um, there are people out there who are interested in what you're doing. And it's a question of balancing whether you recruit them or whether you partner with people with particular skills that you need. Um, and so remaining part of these clusters, engaging with things like the catapult in the UK, but equivalents maybe in Sweden, is always going to be a massive benefit to startups who don't have the ability to recruit all these people and bring all these skills in-house. Um, and I just wanted to leave you with um, a final point, really, and that's that, um, it, it, as I said before, and I'll say it again, um, this is not a technology first thing. This is a business that we're trying to create. And the technology is hugely interesting and we're all passionate about that, but we have to consider and run this as a business. And actually the skills that you build up should be based on that premise. How do we make sure that the thing you're creating, the amazing technology that can be deployed is actually going to still be there in six, 12 months, a year, five years, and how can it grow? So whilst the sales master slide, I did want to just quickly flash up from a really quite good example of um, of how we've done this at the Catapult. And that was through some funding which was given by the UK Space Agency. Um, and this was a large overseas development aid project that we focused on Malaysia. Um, the Catapult acted as a, a thin prime, if you like. It coordinated a consortium of about uh, 15 partners um, to focus its attention on Malaysia. So this was a project that went to Malaysia. It, it discussed issues with about 25 different government departments and created a single system that hosted all of the data um, that they could need across the needs of these departments. And then it brought in the IT experts and the specialist SMEs to then create the solutions and dashboards that three of those departments could um, use. And three was just the limitation of the budget. But the idea was that the overall solution would be scalable to more applications. And the three that they've actually done here is they're called the Marine Watch, Forest Watch, and Flood Watch. These are now live systems. They are dashboards used by, um, in, in anger by the operational departments. And um, it's, been, it's proven 
very successful. The people that have the problems have the information they need to make the decisions. And the, the central government is happy because they've now got a system which can scale up and actually plug in a fourth, a fifth, a sixth application as they go. So it's a really nice um, way of something like a catapult coming in, intervening, solving a problem, bringing in the SMEs and the best of the skills, and then really deploying something to an end user um, challenge space. And then the catapult would exit, leaving industry to then thrive. So I'll stop that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Richard. Um, we have uh, we have used a large margin of that break already, but it was impossible to interrupt you. This was very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, we will also hear more about uh, more focused examples later on. This was a big one, the one you, you mentioned at the end. But just to, to um, not to lose too much time here, we will go to the next speaker. So thank you, Richard and Jamie Reed, Vice President Consulting Services at CGI Space will be our next speaker and he will talk about, um, uh, perhaps we could get the next uh, slide there, Emma. There we go. He will talk about a very, also again, a very big project, but this is more to inspire. This is nothing that you take as the very first, maybe first step in your career when you go, go into to the satellite business area, but, uh, but uh, what is possible? How can we use this kind of data? So how can satellite data, how it can avoid, um, empower life on Earth and counteract fam famine, for, in, for example? So Jamie, please. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Joanna. Um, so yeah, my name is Jamie Reid. Um, so I'm VP for Space Data Platforms and Applications at CGI. Um, you might have heard of CGI. We, we have quite a big business in, in uh, Sweden. Uh, we have a big business in the UK and then the rest of the world, and we're really an IT uh, and consultancy company. Um, mm -hmm. So we really uh, do business um, to help our customers digitally transform uh, their, their supply chains, their, their routes to market, um, and their data processing systems. And we have a fairly large space business, um, so we're involved in building control systems and data management systems for satellite operators and also governments. So we sit in this sweet spot, really, as, as Richard uh, mentioned, of, of the interaction of using that space data um, for real business. Um, and that's really to um, help our customers and, and help their, their end users um, to take advantage of space data alongside all the other data systems that they have. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you today about is a, a really interesting project that we have uh, really started in the last 18 months, which I think illustrates quite well the link between the emerging technology and how that technology can be used um, to the benefit of everybody uh, on the planet, but also to address some of the future problems which are coming up. So, um, of course, when you use new technology and, and come up with new business ideas, it's quite hard to break into markets when, um, when the problems are already uh, seen as being solved. But of course, we're seeing new problems emerge all the time. Um, and that's, that's really the focus of what I'm going to talk about uh, today. So let me see if I can uh, advance the uh, slides. Um, so um, why, why is this happening now? So um, perhaps um, for those of you who aren't familiar with satellites, we're at a, um, an inflection point and a really exciting time in the space industry. And that's because there's a whole um, a plethora of new satellites which have been launched in the last uh, 10 years. So we have the, uh, e e the EU's Copernicus satellites, which provide free, uh, very high quality, uh, scientific quality and operational quality uh, satellite data for anybody to use. You can go and get uh, onto the uh, Copernicus uh, Sentinels uh, website and you can download that data. You can stream it yourself and you can play around with it. It's very easy. You can, you can use Python. Uh, to play around with, with that data. There's toolboxes for using that data. And the European Space Agency has worked very hard to design these satellites and, and make the data available uh, to everybody, partly for environmental monitoring, but also for the benefit of business. Um, so they're really interested in stimulating European businesses um, that want to use that space data to, to, um, to make, make, make business around the world. And of course, Satellites have this great, uh, Richard mentioned it, satellites have this great capability to take uh, global data. Um, so you can really begin to have a scalable business that isn't just operational in the UK or Sweden, but can be operational in places like Malaysia or anywhere else in the world using the same technology. 
What we're also seeing is uh, the rise of commercial satellites, uh, so commercial satellite data, uh, so optical data, infrared and radar data um, that's becoming not just available, but uh, cheaper than it ever has uh, been before. So it's possible to take data now from hundreds of satellites which are orbiting the Earth and use that to build your business. And um, you can use that in very, very flexible ways. Uh, in some cases, you can just go on and, and use your credit card to buy satellite data. So this really enables these kind of new applications. So there's a huge amount of data out there that can be used with other sources of data. So we use it with IoT data, um, as Richard mentioned, but we also use it with uh, business data. So businesses are continuously generating huge amounts of data and fusing that data and, and generating insights for customers uh, is, is really powerful and something that people are willing to pay for. Um, so the uh, project which we're involved, one of the projects that we're involved at the moment is called Digital Twin Earth. And this is a really ambitious program that we're working uh, with uh, the University of Oxford, um, an SME called Trillium and the Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in, uh, in Austria. And this is part of an EU funded activity, which is taking all of that data and trying to use it um, to create what's called a digital twin of the earth. And the idea is to basically create a real time model, very, very high resolution model of the earth and the physical systems on the earth. Um, the starting point for this is very high resolution uh, numerical weather forecasting data. So weather forecasting today is typically done on a 30 kilometer uh, grid uh, globally. Sometimes it's done uh, more finely. But the idea of this project is to do a numerical weather forecasting every three hours on a one kilometer grid. And not only to do weather forecasting, but also do climate uh, forecasting. So climate forecasting is even more complicated um, and is very hard to, to get any kind of local detail out of climate uh, forecast and predictions. Um, the objective, one of the objectives of, of this of this project, is to enable um, uh, uh, policymakers and businesses to use that climate data in a really hyper local sense. So you'll be able to say, if I want to build um, a building or I want to build a bridge uh, in any particular area, what's the climate likely to do over the next fifty years? And of course, that's incredibly important because that affects the, the, the design of, of, those, uh, of those buildings. Um, so businesses are willing to pay and get and are very interested in this kind of um, information. Um, there's also uh, a number of other um, uh, models uh, which will be included in this. And we're, we're looking at food systems and that's because of our expertise in supply chain management. So we work uh, with a lot of companies um, developing su supply chain management systems as, as well as our space business. So it seemed like a good, good fit for us to work on. Um, so the idea is that this, this food system uh, digital twin will be part of the overall digital twin earth uh, project. And you'll hear more about this over the coming years uh, as it becomes more important in Europe. So some of the reasons we, we looked at global food systems and, and regional food systems as well is because um, they're increasingly under stress. So um, we see drought um, as becoming a major factor in the next 20 years. It's a problem that needs to be solved. Um, in the UK, we had some very, we've had very um, severe droughts over the last few years. Um, and in Sweden, you've, you had some droughts in 2018. Um, but alongside droughts, we also see uh, sea level rise, which is obviously affecting coastal communities. But we're also seeing floods. So um, last year we had both drought conditions and we also had flood conditions in the UK, which makes it very hard for um, the entire supply chain, uh, the food supply chain, um, even in very highly developed countries to um, to actually manage uh, an effective supply chain. So there's a huge interest in, in improving the modeling around this where satellite data is only part of it, um, but it has huge um, and very significant commercial impacts. Um, and these are, I would say, large scale commercial impacts. So these can be things like the overall supply of wheat um, to a nation, but it can be uh, quite small scale because it can go down to individual fields and individual producers. So it covers a wide range of scales, which means that it's quite complicated to, 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 to actually produce anything which gives useful information. Um, so what we're doing is in our project, um, and this kind of gives you an idea of the complexity, I think, 
of um, how uh, satellite data is being used and how it can be used. Um, what we're doing is we're using um, extreme precipitation AI models, so artificial intelligence models with global crop models. We using that with cropland um, uh, cropland use ass assessment, so how the how the crops are used, and then we're integrating that into socio-economic and supply chain models to actually produce forecasts of future supply chains. And the interest here is that, and talk it, and this go, talks to to Richard's point about. Um, it's not just about the technology. Here, we're giving um, both producers and policymakers the ability to uh, experiment and try different policies and different um, approaches in the simulations. So they'll be able to go in and they'll be able to simulate what happens if I switch from one variety of wheat to another variety of wheat. Will that be more robust to the future climate or not? Um, and that's a complex question. It sounds simple. But um, when you're take, talking about both drought and um, flooding conditions, as well as other conditions, it, it actually becomes extremely um, difficult to, to uh, difficult problem to solve and a difficult question to, to, to answer. Although at a high level, you don't necessarily need very complex maps or anything like that to answer it. You, the policymakers want a very simple answer and so do the producers. So the aim of this is to produce very high level information from a very, very complex set of uh, observations and physical models. Um, so hopefully that's given you an idea really of the complexity of the kind of solutions that satellite data, when it's combined with other data sources can solve. Um, in our project, we're looking very much uh, at um, conditions in the developed countries. Um, so we're looking at supply chains in, uh, in most, mostly in Northern Europe uh, and also in Australia, uh, and the US as well is also quite important to us. But ultimately, the real benefits of this will come in places like Africa and Southeast Asia, where they're uh, facing incredible stresses in their food supply chains. Um, and we're working with organizations like the World Bank on how we can um, apply this technology in those areas. But it creates very uh, interesting new applications um, combining these complex data models. Um, which can then be used to generate new business. So what we're producing here is very much an information system for policy makers, but ultimately the models and techniques that we're using can be used for other, other situations, which are equally complicated. So an example um, output of, of uh, or an example output of our kind of model is what's the impact on uh, the uh, delivery lorries, for example, and trucks. Um, that, again, you know, that sounds like a rather esoteric question, but people are willing to pay for that kind of data, um, particularly on a kind of seasonal basis. So um, you can see that there are um, many, many opportunities here, particularly as satellites are able to um, address some of these future problems that I think we'll all be facing in the next 20 years. Um, OK, so that's the end of my presentation. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Jamie. That was another very important puzzle to, to the big picture here when trying to understand what this business is all about and all these opportunities that we have, both in complex, uh, complex uh, uh, project, we could say, as this one, and also down to smaller that we will talk about now, for instance, or smaller, at least more focused. We will go, to, thank you so much. And we will go to our next speaker, which is Robert Schmidt, who is a founder and CEO at Vultus in Sweden. So this is a Swedish company. Uh, you're, you are working with, with fertilizing and uh, how this can be saving costs in the farming business. So please, welcome. Thanks a lot, and thanks for having me. Um, I just want to check, how do I uh, switch the slides? Yeah, just... Right now I have it. Yeah. yeah, so I just press. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so at Viltus, our uh, mission is to eliminate waste in farming. And so the really sort of significant thing that, that we're addressing is uh, the pretty persistent sort of overuse of chemical inputs. So most growers, they apply most of their chemical inputs evenly across the field. And you kind of guesstimate how much you're going to apply based on usually quite sort of crude ways you've done it historically. And this results in a lot of waste. So nitrogen, which is by far the biggest fertilizer, 
there uh, about 55% goes to waste. Um, and for other inputs, you have uh, similar levels of waste. And this leads to a lot of um, sort of pressures. I mean, we've heard about the, the climate related pressures previously today, um, but it, it, this input waste leads to a lot of costs for the farmer. And it also leads to quality issues and yield concerns. Um, and all these things combined, so combined with like the really intense pressure sort of uh, to, to compete, um, all the pressures from, from climate, from regulation, for sustainability, uh, it's really a tough time for most farmers. And there's mo many, many farmers are actually going out of business today uh, because of the, this really challenging business environment. So how we address this and how we try to help is that we provide uh, precise satellite recommendations um, where we basically measure how much fertilizer is needed in different parts of the field and then give a recommendation for where it's most economically beneficial to apply those inputs. Uh, and this means you can have pretty significant input savings. So nitrogen, which is where we've come the furthest. Um, so we've demonstrated uh, numerous times that you can save about 30% of your nitrogen use uh, and still get quality increase and also yield increases. So for an average sort of mid-sized farmers, mid-sized farmer, this means you can gain about 20,000 euros per farm per year, uh, which is quite significant in terms of their ROI. And I think the core thing we're trying to do is produce more food using less chemicals uh, and also less land. And this means you have better margins of the production, you have better yields, and also you have better food quality. So in terms of how can our services are offered and available, I'd say kind of right now, so March, April, May, that that's when most of the sort of fertilization happens. And so we're in a very busy period, but we have services that kind of provide data all around the year. Uh, so we have uh, things related to sort of the uh, monitoring health, the water status, um, um, performance of your fields historically, um, sort of all these different types of tools that help you plan different parts of the year and help you kind of decide how you should manage your farm. So I think our, our general goal is that we want to, you know, really help reduce all types of waste in the farm. I think nitrogen is, is probably where we have the biggest impact right now, but uh, ultimately we want to have this apply to most kind of important decisions and also most inputs that are being applied. Um, some things that we do quite uh, differently is that, you know, we're not, um, we don't sell generally directly to farmers, but we're trying to build this as an infrastructure. So we're trying to connect this with other uh, sort of platforms in the space and also build out all these tools in a way so that local actors can use these tools and offer them to their local markets and adapt them in certain ways. Um, and this means that it's a pretty scalable approach. I think it's it's kind of leveraging the benefits of satellite data and, and making a business model that is sort of hyper scalable in this very, because farming is such a fragmented sector, it's it's so localized, it's so sort of everything should be local. Uh, and, and so we're kind, kind of trying to build this satellite infrastructure so that it can adapt into that marketplace um, and have had uh, quite a bit of success with that already. Um, in terms of our technology, so we combine uh, different types of sensors. So we combine both uh, multispectral uh, sort of optical data and also microwave remote sensing. Um, and this um, has a lot of benefits. It, we can, the key benefit is that we have data regardless of cloud conditions, uh, which is also a really nice, nice thing, uh, but it's, it's pretty complicated to work all these different satellite types. Uh, but yeah, we've spent a lot of time and money on R&D to build out a really robust sort of monitoring system that is optimized for certain crops and um, it, it, it measures things quite accurately because of that. So we, because we have this infrastructure approach, it allows us to work kind of quite broadly across geographies. Um, our commercial focus is in sort of Central and Eastern Europe, um, but we have, you know, partners who, who kind of connect with our API and use our services across the world, uh, including like regions like Pakistan and China and so forth. And I mean, as a result, we've had quite a lot of usage. So right now we have, you know, uh, over 700,000 hectares using our products. Um, and this is a number that's kind of growing kind of incrementally each quarter as, as we're adding on new partners and we're getting more and more adoption in those different regions. Um, and yeah, so I mean, I think this year we're hoping to grow it uh, significantly as well. Um, and in terms of the market, you know, I would say, you know, right now precision agriculture is still relatively small. It's it's quite a new market, but it is something which we foresee becoming a standard practice in most parts of the world. I think it will be, you know, something that you're not competitive if you don't do it. I think as, as more and more of the farmers adopt this, this will have to be something that everyone adopts uh, to stay competitive. 
Um, we have already kind of all the, the analysis ready to, to, to do this. We have most of the infrastructure available in terms of the farm. Uh, I think now it's a question of making sure that there's adoption and making it very intuitive and easy to use. Um, and I think now, you know, we're seeing a lot of commercial solutions coming out that are trying to address this problem, including us. Um, so I think precision agriculture will, will become a really big, big market uh, moving forward and it's going to continue growing um, in the next few, like next decade. In terms of our team, so we're a team of 20 people. Um, we have, uh, we were founded about uh, so four and a half years ago uh, and we've been growing over the last sort of two years quite a bit. So we were, you know, maybe six people or so two years two years ago, um, and we're continuing to grow now, adding on quite a few new team members. Um, and kind of why we're doing this and, and what really drives us and, and drives our company, why we think this is so important is, I think improving the efficiency of farming is extremely important um, because we need to produce more food, but using less inputs and using uh, less land and less resources. Uh, so it is really a, a challenge of supplying food for the world. I think that is one really key part and doing so in a way that is sustainable because uh, we can't, you know, the way we have combated famine in the past has been plow forests to make more land that we can produce more food on. We simply don't have enough food. It is like not true that we have more than enough food. Like there's, there's hundreds of millions of people starving uh, currently. And this is an issue that's becoming more and more severe moving forward um, as population grows. So I think it is extremely important to, to have efficiency improving technologies in farming. And it's, you know, we can, we can improve food production by making more emissions, like we can do that. Like that's not a problem, but doing so without increasing emissions is really, really hard. And I think that's kind of the thing that we need to nail. And that's really what we're, we're focusing on doing. Uh, and lastly, kind of where we want to go with this is that we, you know, we want to be kind of the central sort of stack for precision agriculture in terms of infrastructure using satellite data, um, being connected. You know, if, if you want to offer these types of services to, to farmers, uh, you know, instead of trying to build it yourself, you should just be able to connect it to an infrastructure provider like us. Um, and being in this position, you know, we, uh, we get a lot of data from different regions um, and we can also address a lot of different verticals in, in the space. Um, so we've had a lot of interesting discussions with food producers, for example, also things like crop insurance and agri commodities, uh, where, you know, the data about what's going on in the fields is, is extremely important for the supply chains and these other services. Uh, so, you know, we, we think there's a lot of potential to synthesize this information and use it across, uh, across the supply chain. Um, and we're really excited for, for the impact we can have uh, with our technology on doing that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Robert. It seems like you and Jamie need to talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit more. Uh, we, we've just had you talking about um, a field where, where the market is rapidly growing. You seem to have a scalable solution, so the, the future looks very bright for you. And also, I hope that the audience today could uh, relate a bit to what is possible to do here if you just find the right end user and, and see where where the needs are. And I mean also also working with all these global challenge, challenges that we have like starvation and, and, and so forth. It must mm. feel many very meaningful, yeah, which is absolutely. also important for, for people uh -huh. when they go to work. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing that we have in, in our region as everywhere is the problem to attract well-educated people. But if you can offer jobs that are meaningful, interesting, high tech, and everything at the same time, uh, this is how you build the region, I guess. So thank you so much. I can tell you that we have one minute for a short break and then we will be on time again. So stand up, make some movements and uh, we will be going to continue with our, our next speaker, Steve, in, in just a minute. So please just stand up for a little while and, and, and move. Maybe take a glass of water or, or something. Be back in one minute. So, 
9.50, 10 minutes to 10, we will start again. And uh, thank you so much to the previous speakers. We have one more left before we have a panel to discuss interesting questions. Uh, we would like to invite Steve Spittles from Global Trust, co-founder and CTO. He will talk about the commercialization of space data to act ethically for a better world. So we are continuing on this sustainability path, which is so connected to space data. So the floor is yours. And there we go. Right, thank you very much. And thanks to Hannah and the team for, for inviting uh, myself today to, to present on this actually extremely exciting topic. Um, I'm not gonna give a kind of standard introduction to a company presentation, because I appreciate that they're not always the most exciting things to kind of uh, sit through and watch. Rather, what I'm gonna do is hopefully give you a much better and broader understanding of the markets that we're particularly interested in and you can start to understand why and how we've created the company that we have today. So, right. So I wanna start by saying, you know, climate change and its general awareness of its impact continues to have a profound effect on the economies, on social priorities, on cultural perspectives around all the major economies of the world. And this, along with other global challenges, so we heard Robert talk about sort of starvation, uh, we can think about things like depletion of natural resources as well. This is causing businesses to change their practice on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition to this, we're starting to see things like purchasing behaviors and access to finance uh, that, that governments and citizens are both doing themselves, creating a demand that society at large adopts new approaches that then safeguards our planet in the longer term. Delivering these transparent and ethical practices is really beginning to take precedence over some of the more typical or more traditional kind of financial practices that we've had in the past. Um, and this, of course, it sadly it comes with its own challenges. Um, so, you know, at the moment, governments and industries really struggles to get access to reliable intelligence to understand what they should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, but also being able to monitor what they are trying to do. And this puts huge amounts of risk uh, around these co uh, companies' credibility. And they start end up being in a position where they might even be creating ill-informed decisions. And this is really where Global Trust has positioned itself. And I want to take the next sort of 10 minutes or so going through this in a bit more detail and talking through the underpinning uh, markets that sit behind this. So Global Trust itself is trying to address both the Swedish and the UK demands by forming what we've done here, which is forming a data analytics company. Uh, and we've got a proposed presence in both the UK and in Sweden under a common brand, Global Trust. Today, we are just based in Winchester in the UK, which was the, uh, the first capital of England. For those who are not aware of the, uh, Winchester, it's based in the south of England uh, near the coast. Uh, but we've got a, um, over the next 12 months, we'll be setting up a, an office in Stockholm. And also we can possibly see the ability then also to set up an office in Norbottom, making use of a lot of the skills, again, that Joanna was uh, making reference to earlier. Now we've set up to address three main market areas, corporate social responsibility, ethical investment, and public policy delivery. And I'll spend the next couple of slides going through uh, and explaining each of these different markets. And then right at the end, I will finish with a technical example about how we can apply this then to the ethical investment market. So corporate social responsibility, for those that haven't come across this before, this is really the need for individual entities and organizations to take proactive and immediate responsibility for the impact that they're having both on society, on economies, and very much importantly, then also on the environment as well, across the whole uh, supply chain. And generally, this is being driven uh, in line with sort of public expectations, but also more and more recently, now with regulations as well, which is good. The reason that companies do this today, predominantly, is to make sure that they maintain their brand reputation, 
They make sure that they're attracting new talent to their companies, the people who believe, for example, in environmental uh, uh, practices and safeguarding our planet. Uh, and generally just meeting that kind of social expectation that we have today. But we see this changing going forward in the future. And actually, one of the biggest aspects we see for uh, corporate social responsibility and the need for corporates to do this is actually attracting and retaining investment and capital uh, as the company goes forward. And that hooks in then to the ethical investment piece that I'll talk about in a minute. What you might not be aware of is actually CSR is, is broken down into kind of four major categories. The first one is all around ethical responsibility. So for example, this is about the sort of welfare of employees. Uh, so ensuring uh, labor practices, for example. Um, you then got philanthropic responsibility. So people might've come across this before where companies might be wanting to uh, invest money to sort of maybe help with uh, planting trees, for example, in another country, or they might be donating time or humanitarian aid, for example. Environmental CSR is possibly the most um, well known. This is all around maybe limiting their pollution, reducing greenhouse gases, uh, making sure that they minimize the amount of environmental degradation they're having on the local environment. And then finally, economical responsibility is really kind of a hybrid between philanthropic responsibility and environmental responsibility. So it's trying to have a balance between uh, financial and environmental impact. Now, currently, the way that this works is that most corporates end up carrying out the CSR uh, themselves, but also they are the ones that are then monitoring the impacts of the CSR themselves. And this is now getting to a place where this is causing people to often lose trust within these companies. You know, we take uh, the extractive industries, for example, oil, gas, mining, and they're sitting there going, oh, aren't we creating a great impact on the environment? People are sitting there going, but are you? Can we trust this information that's coming from you yourself? More than that as well, lots of these companies are maybe not making the best decisions about what their practices should be for corporate social responsibility. This is both where global trust comes into play, but also satellites more broadly. Satellites obviously are a third party uh, uh, data source. People often actually have an inherent trust because of the fact that it comes from a place of an image and you can go back in time and start to see where this information comes from. And creating trusted services from satellites is becoming a really interesting business opportunity within the corporate social responsibility market. From an ethical perspective, uh, you might have come across ethical investors. So these, these are investors that are particularly interested in sort of monitoring the sort of sustainable practice of their existing portfolio, but also looking and making sure that when they're looking for new clients to invest in, that those clients are making sure that they've got a high level of ESG or environmental, social and governance. Uh, and these three factors, this environmental, social and governance, are really used to measure the company's sustainability and its ethical impact. And what these ethical investors are trying to do is balance off the fact that if they are investing in the company that carries out much better ESG practices, there's a much lower risk of that company uh, doing uh, having brand damage reputation, for example, or being held to large financial uh, fines in the future. So they're recognizing that this is actually a really good way of getting um, low risk, but actually long term return as well on their investment without harming the world around us and without harming their profitability. Um, again, this is where someone like Global Trust and satellite technology really has a role to play. Um, many of these uh, portfolios that the investor community are looking at are huge and they cover whole supply chains. You know, there's an example that I'll give at the end of this presentation where there's a group of ethical investors that are investing over 20 trillion, 20 trillion dollars worth of investment within the mining supply chain. This is huge and it has global impact. And because of the inherent global nature of satellite technology, it means it's perfectly placed to be able to <clears throat> not just look at the environmental impact of a single organization, but look at the impact of a whole industry on a global scale. Um, you can see here that there's also some, some stats at the bottom here, uh, which shows the size of market here that we're talking about. And this is, this is absolutely huge and something that we see as being a huge emerging market 
uh, not just for the satellite industry, but as a globe as a whole going forward. The final market I want to talk about today uh, then looks at public policy. Uh, and this is normally either the sort of delivery of services for sort of direct national benefit through sort of taxes and such like, or is the result of people in countries actually um, deeming that there are important national priorities that need to be addressed in other countries. So for example, that could be what I've got here, such as the reducing of impact every day on the world's climate, or it could be being able to provide and assist overseas countries that are unable to have that level of uh, economic sustainability themselves. I and mean, we recognize that the UK and Sweden are actually two of the largest contributors to overseas development aid, uh, with the UK, I think, being the world's second largest investing something like uh, 15 billion uh, per year. And I think Sweden uh, invests something close to about 5 billion per year. And this is huge. And this is this is a great thing because it's going in the right direction. And it's something that we as UK and Swedish uh, nationals believe in strongly. Uh, but it also opens up huge markets then as well. Um, for, for other technologies to come in and help deliver some of these programs. And satellite Earth observation technologies can obviously help start things like targeting aid. We can help with cross-border conflicts. We can help create sustainable development plans for looking at new sustainable cities or smart grids, putting out interesting energy uh, infrastructure going forward. And again, this is where someone like Global Trust ourselves, we're starting to really look at this area and provide real impact going forward. So if I move on from the markets now and just, just take a quick second to, to talk a, sec, a bit more about Global Trust, obviously we're, we're taking all of these satellite data sets along with multiple other ge, uh, geospatial information sources like Jamie mentioned earlier, sort of IoT based sources, it could be economical information or it could be information coming from our clients. We're using both mature uh, and trusted techniques and also using slightly more innovative ones as well uh, to then derive information in the markets that I've just spoken about. The reason that we are also particularly unique here at Global Trust is because we are building upon this really strong heritage. As Richard said, we are a spin out of the satellite applications catapult in the UK, this kind of not-for-profit UK government entity, but we're also part of the SSC uh, group as a whole, uh, and is our majority holder of the company. Um, and this sort of quasi government background that we have really helps us to then continue to build up that trust with our clients. And this market that we're going into is all about credibility and it's all about trust. Before I go into the example and I, and I finish off and I, I leave it to the panel discussion, I wanted to give a quick example about how complex this ecosystem is that we're playing in. So there are talks about three major types of end users. We've got governments and multilateral banks. So multilateral banks, I'm talking about things like the World Bank or the Inter-American Development Bank, for example, really sort of pushing sustainability agendas in, in maybe developing countries. We're talking about investor communities, so that, that second ring out. And we're also talking about corporates. And actually, they all interrelate to each other. More than that as well, there's then a large value-added service uh, company element to the ecosystem. Both those environmental consultancies that maybe don't use space today, but also those space companies who are looking to try and move into the sustainability area. And again, hooking back to Richard's uh, conversation, it's really important to recognize that a lot of these should be not just competition, but your partners. You know, you're not going to try and solve the world's issues just with a, a single company, and maybe you don't want to get access to all the skills. You know, it's important to recognize that there are a lot of companies that are building, built up that have very credible skills that you can draw in and make use of yourself. And I, I wanted to show this very kind of abstract diagram to give an idea of the complexity of the markets that we're playing with here. So to go on to a quick example, um, this is all around ethical investment. You might be aware that in 2019, on the 25th of January, there was a tailing storage facility collapse, where a tailing storage facility on the left hand side here is where all the waste material from the mine goes. And in these large dam structures, you have some really horrible contaminants from some uh, strong acids like hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acids, depending on the metals that they're trying to extract, um, all the way to, to different phenomena such as acid mining leachage as well. And what happened was 
this tailing storage facility within Brazil. It collapsed and it ended up killing over 270 people and it's now caused thousands of years worth of environmental damage. Um, I was lucky enough to get flown out there as part of a UK government export uh, expert group to help them make sure that this doesn't happen again in the future. And as part of that, uh, we, we actually went to the site and you can start to see the scale of this. The building that you've got in the background there is absolutely huge. There's the impact that this is having on the surrounding environment is, is so difficult to quantify. And you can start to see people try and mitigate this on the ground and you realize quite how small humans really are up against nature. Um, and another, well, I went a bit fast there. Oh, look. There's always one. There we are. And another diagram and another picture of it as well to give you some scale as there. So what we did is we went out there and we said, well, look, actually, you know, this isn't about blaming the person or the company which has actually done this. It's about making sure that we take proactive steps to make sure this doesn't happen in the future. When we came back to the UK, we got invited to a ethical investment uh, round table, which was led by the Church of England Pension Board and by the Swedish Council of Ethics Pension Board. And they recognized um, that after conversations that satellite technology, because of their global nature, because they're third party as well, that they were really well situated to create a global monitoring system where we could provide a lot of information without actually having to go to the mine itself and make sure that those mining companies are doing as they should be doing and making sure they're safe and they're not moving. Using uh, Interferometric SAR technologies, we are able to monitor the embankment of the tailing stand down to a millimeter or two in line of sight of the satellite. What I've got here is a diagram of Bromandino. I've got a couple of small letters uh, across it. Um, that top diagram, I'm looking at two bits at the top of the dam, two points upon the top of the dam. And in September, the, uh, just before it collapsed in January, we can see that actually two points next to each other started to diverge quite heavily. And this should cause red flags within the system and mean then they should send out a ground-based survey to make sure that the tailing storage facility itself is, um, is secure. And again, the bottom diagram is, is showing the difference between the dam itself and the surrounding area. And we can see that the surrounding area is undergoing uplift, whereas the dam itself is actually undergoing subsidence. Again, showing this differential movement, which could cause red flags within the system. The pension boards uh, and the ethical investors recognize that actually, while they don't necessarily um, have the time or, or knowledge to, to come and look at each individual dam, what this does is it creates a system where the mining companies know that they're being monitored and they're having to behave a lot better. More than that as well, these investment companies wouldn't pay for necessarily such a system where they're proposing that they, they they actually create an institute that is a 24 hour institute that monitors all these dams on a global scale. And they'll make sure that every single company they invest in actually maybe subsidizes such an institute such as this. And that's how you get that kind of uh, sustainable business model going forward. The next slide um, is then demonstrating how you take this maybe from a single dam or, or a very kind of scientific diagram that I showed you before and how you scale this up on a platform and do it then on a, on a global basis. Um, and you know, what we're trying to do here as, as global trust is be able to create these applications in a way that is then intuitive to the end users, create scale, uh, and is most importantly then creating a, a positive impact to our world around us and safeguarding our planet going forward. And I hope through that example, you can see how we go to the kind of intangible markets all the way then to the tangible uh, technology application itself. Um, but I'm really happy to talk about this in a bit more uh, in a bit more detail through the panel discussion because I appreciate it's a very quick example. So I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you so much, Steve. Now we have come to the point where we will stop sharing our presentation and uh, invite everybody who has been speaking to a panel. It will be a little bit shorter than planned, but uh, I mean, uh, life goes on after this webinar as well. So we can always chat in other channels and talk. And hopefully you have been able to build a network even if we don't meet in person. So we have um, 
we have a couple of questions here and I, I as we are we are our, our target group here is uh, small and medium sized companies or other companies in our region who are interested in getting into this business. So the first question would be a little bit more about the business getting in. I mean, they are experts in IT, uh, software development, etc. But what what would be your best advice? If all of you can can answer this, what would be your best advice for a company thinking of entering this business and who has not been there before? What what would be the advice? Who would like to start? A very short one, one two, one minute. Sure, sure. I, I can, I can quickly. Yeah, Richard. So, um, I, I think it comes back to what I said at the beginning, um, which was really to, to to think about it as a business, not just as a technology, uh, and to do whatever you can to engage as closely as possible with your clients um, and really understand the challenges they're facing on a day to day basis. What what is the one or two things that's causing them pain or a problem on a daily basis? And if you can really distill down to that level of granularity. The provision of the technology is actually almost the easy part. So I would suggest that. Mm. Think about it, the business. It's business or, as usual. You listen to the customer. Yeah. Yeah. And anybody I mean, has something to add there for the most? Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, what? So what I would add is, this is there are a lot of people in 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 the space business doing this now. So it's a very it's a very fertile field. There are lots of SMEs out there. Uh, trying to sell data, trying to sell information derived from data. So the key, I think, is to identify a niche, identify, a. I mean, this is, this is kind of business school 101, isn't it? Have a great idea and then go and sell it. Well, you know, that makes it sound really easy, doesn't it? But uh, yeah, ultimately, that great idea should be aligned with a real world need. So this comes back to what Rich was saying. But I think it has to be something where you're offering some real added value, where it's something that only you can do or only you have that relationship with the customer. Because if you're coming in from a technology perspective or saying we can do we can do everything under the sun. Uh, and the problem with satellites is because it's a global global technology, it's very easy to come up with very big ideas. But actually, the best ideas are the ones that start small and then grow and become scalable. And those are the ones that I've seen be successful. But you've got to have that really good niche to get into to start with. Yeah. So, so it really makes sense that like companies in our region, they start with local challenges. They speak with their customer or the end user and they have open innovation together. You could say you, you develop yeah. together with your customer. Yeah, and then uh, then. At the end of the day, when when things start to work, hopefully you have something developed here that is scalable. Yeah. Because if you can use it in our region, you most probably have end users in other regions, and there are yeah. many regions out there. Yeah, yeah, fine, very good. Uh, I'll I'll go to the next question because uh, we have been talking about different kind of data here, like Earth observation, taking images. We're talking about communication. Uh, and we are talking about uh, navigation also. Um, and I wonder, is there any difference between these data, handling these data, or, or are there the same kind of technical uh, challenges? Or it, it seems like the market is biggest in the EU, um, Earth observation with, with images. But uh, do you agree in that, or? I, I can come in here if you want. So I think. I think there is definitely a way uh, that you, you handle these data differently. I mean, as, as Richard showed, some, some of the satellite communication markets currently dwarf the Earth observation ones around media and things like this. Um, but I think that there's a common factor here, and it's the fact that it's, um, if you think about global navigation satellite systems, IoT systems that Jamie was talking about, you know, they've all got a geographic tag associated to them. And this is where the sort of idea of geospatial data comes in. Um, so therefore, you know, the, the power around this is being able to layer data over the same geographical areas, maybe at the same time, maybe at varying times. And that's that's the really exciting thing here with satellite data, with other complementary data sets. And we recognize that satellite Earth observation is only ever one part of a much larger solution. Uh, so I think it's it, rather than saying, you know, is, is Earth observation the most important one is, is, is most much more about making sure you've almost got a community of data sets, an ecosystem of different data sources here that you're relying upon 
Um, and there are similarities between them, but there's, uh, like any data sets, there's, there's different ones as well. And you can pre-process that data to a certain level to make sure that they become even more comparable. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, yes, Steve? Uh, I, I would add to that, uh, that I think sort of Earth observation, sort of commercial Earth observation is sort of a, a quite small segment that's growing very rapidly and that's a lot of sort of future growth in, ahead of it. But kind of the biggest sectors, I mean, I think communications is one of them. I would say even within Earth observation, I think by far the biggest sector is like governmental and military use cases. I mean, if you go to events, like most like of the... The, the, the actors in the space are focused on those areas. So I think the sort of commercial side is, is really something that is very, very small, but it's growing very rapidly on the shoulders of all those other things that have been done. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting space and it's, uh, it's, it's, it, like it's, it's good to know about that background that you know, it stems from military and government. Um, it, it does. I mean, your question as well was about um, how easy is it to use and combine these things uh, as well as just, is it a good idea? Um, I think what's happened over the last 10 to 15 years probably is adoption of standards a lot more than we ever saw before. I mean, before that, every sensor was bespoke, the data set, the formats even of the data were completely impossible to understand for a layperson. You needed to be almost part of the core scientific team to be able to get into the data. So um, common standards adoption of not just standards of data, but interoperability between systems, um, this all helps. It means the barriers come down significantly for, for non-experts to start engaging with some of these tools. Well, yeah, yeah. One, um, one thing I would say, you talked about the sort of skills. In, in our business, I've got 85 people in my team. The majority of them are, are software developers. So the standards are kind of software development skills that you guys, your, the companies in your region have, are just the right skills. And, and then we've got a few people who have specific data specialisms, um, so data analysts, um, we've got a few uh, subject matter experts in satellite communications and so on uh, in, in, in managing satellite data. But fun fundamentally, those software development skills that you'd be using for any other software or IT solution are, are just the right ones to have. Mm. Yeah, of course, you need, you need to understand your, your market. But, and that can be actually one of the biggest challenges here to understand what is the best idea? Who, who, who will really need this and pay for it? But, but another thing, when we're talking about satellite data, we'll, we very often talk about big data, big data amounts. Is that true? Or will these data amounts become much smaller as they are processed in these standards that you are talking about, Richard? Or will the companies working with satellite data have to have huge uh, facilities to to be able to do this. Um, I think well, the, the total volume of data being collected is is growing almost exponentially. So I, I think that the pool of data that people have access to is is is, is enormous. Um, I think what's happening though is that the the sophistication of the the, the tools, the the power of the underpinning IT is getting ever better. And so that you don't, as an individual now, need to actually build massive server rooms sort of things. You can access huge volumes of data almost on your phone. Um, so I think a lot of it is down to the tool sets uh, and the way that the data is being managed in a central way. Um, there's a question about who should pay for that, of course, and what the business model is, but it's, it's becoming far easier um, to access these big data. But then again, you are right. The, ultimately, the end user wants an answer to a, a question, and that may be a simple, yes or no, do I do something or not? And, and so you end up distilling down enormous amounts of data to very, very small amounts of data through, through the value add that your company is bringing. And that, that's, that is really why the customer would pay you is to do that transformation. They don't want to, to have to worry about satellite imagery or any geospatial data. They just want an answer to a question. I would, I would add to that. I think the kind of the efficiencies we get by really clipping away and just using the, the, the small amount of data we're, that we actually need to use. Um, I think for a lot of applications that saves a lot of computational power. I think for, for us, for example, you know, if, if we're analyzing just one field, you know, if we're talking about entire satellite scenes, that's, that's a lot of data. But when I talk about a field, you're talking about just kilobytes of data usually. And it's really not that sort of computationally heavy to, to manage that. I think, you know, yes, you know, we're, we're collecting a lot of data and you're trying to combine a lot of different things and do a lot of complex analytics and so forth. And, and so that can be challenging, but 
I think uh, you shouldn't be scared of it just from the sake of, oh, now we're collecting so much data because it can be done and the architecture can be made in such a way that it is very, very manageable. You can even run it on, uh, you know, very cheap servers on the cloud or even have it uh, locally uh, if need be. Absolutely. They're the tools I was talking about. Exactly that. Yeah. yeah. As a user, you shouldn't have to worry about it. Yeah. No. And one thing I just 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 add in there, sorry, Jana, just one one last point is don't forget your customers are also on this journey. So most organizations and customers, government, big big SMEs and so on are familiar with cloud technology. Many of them will have their own data scientists. They will be experts. They'll, they're, they're doing exactly this themselves. So you don't have to do everything. You, you can work with them um, and find the right solution. So things like API so that they can consume your data is a really good solution. You don't have to do everything. Yeah, the, perfect. That was the perfect answer, I think, that we will end the panel with, because that means that it is doable. And to take this leap is not giant, but of course there are some small leaps to be taken. Uh, I would like to thank the panelists, the speakers so much. It has been really interesting. I wish we had one more hour because we could continue easily but I don't want to steal too much time of, of everybody. So we will end the English part here. And I will tell everybody that we have recorded this. So we will put it up on the, our website. We will send everybody who attended uh, an email where you will find some of, some of the presentations will be uploaded as well. And I hope really that you, uh, you are inspired to continue and follow us to the last 10 minutes of this program and which will be in Swedish and Emma if you are kind enough to uh, put on the presentation again we will listen to Conny Hörkvors who is in charge of this SME program as I, I was talking about so now the panelists you have to be practicing your Swedish Då går vi över på svenska och vi önskar då Emil, nej inte Emil utan Conny, Conny Hökfors, välkommen att berätta om det här programmet. För det är ju till för att hjälpa er som vill in i branschen. Så varsågod Conny. Tack så mycket allihop. Det känns nästan konstigt att prata i svenska, på svenska men vi har ju sagt att vi ska göra det. Ja, det här programmet inom RIT-projektet som heter Affärsmöjligheter med satellitdata är ju ett, är ett program som har en avstamp i det här webbinariet som vi har idag. Vi, vi hoppas att ni genom den här fina presentationerna ska lite se de affärsmöjligheter och potentialen som finns i den här branschen. Och vi tänker också att ni som företagare brukar ställa er frågorna, är den här idén bra nog att satsa på? Finns, finns det helt andra marknader som är intresserade av det vi kan leverera? Finns det potential att börja sälja utanför Sverige? Vad behöver vi få fram för underlag för att kunna gå vidare med den här idén? Och det här är några av de sakerna vi vill svara på i det här programmet. Programmet syftar ju till att driva innovation, att skapa nya affärsmöjligheter och som Rickard sa, Richard sa, det är ju i huvudsak affärer och i andra hand teknik. Vi vill ju också stärka kompetenser för att leverera produkter och tjänster baserade på de här data från satelliten. Och såklart skapa nya samarbeten mellan de SME och småföretagen som är i gruppen. Men också kanske med andra större bolag som är med i den här kontexten. Vi kommer inte att ha en deltagaravgift för programmet utan... Däremot så kommer man att omfatta stadsstödsreglerna i vanlig ordning. Vi tänker oss ett upplägg där vi har fyra block. Där vi har inledet med ett inspirationsblock som vi nu har haft idag. Där vi har fått en fin och bred inblick i vilka möjligheter som finns inom det här området. Vi tänker oss ett nästa block som handlar om teknik och då är det mer att förstå de grundläggande principerna för inbjuden fjärranalys och få insikter i applikationer, vilken potential det finns, vilka utmaningar som man måste överkomma ändå för att kunna jobba med den här tekniken, för det finns trots allt. Sen tänker jag oss en styr i idégenereringsprocess utifrån det här 
inspiration och teknik som vi har tagits till oss så jobbar vi med att försöka generera idéer till affärsmöjligheter inom det här området. Och med lite hemläxa mellan de här passen så kan vi, se, kan vi sedan identifiera och testa en första affärshypotes av några av de här idéerna och se är det här hållbart? Finns det en marknad för den här idén? Vi, vi kommer att använda oss av resurser från LTU och jag vill också samtidigt flagga lite för deras kurs som de har för de som vill fördjupa sig lite grann när det gäller satellitbaserad jord observationsdata. Där har man en online-kurs. Den här gick i november i fjol, men man kommer även att köra en kurs i år. Och det är med det som håller i den på LTU. Och här, kan man ju, här kommer ju en ytterligare fördjupning i de här fem, fem tillfällena. Uh, <hör> Vi, det här är teamet som arbetar med programmet. Det är Emma, Olle, jag och Johanna. Och vi hoppas att efter de här presentationerna och de här dragningarna att ni ska ha fått så mycket inspiration och lust att ni vill anmäla er för det här programmet och känna att ni vill jobba vidare med de här affärsmöjligheterna inom satellitdata. Att ni känner att det finns en potential och det finns något som vi skulle kunna göra. Och som flera av presentatörerna också har sagt så är ni ju ni IT-bolag precis rätt kompetens för att ta hand om det här datat och göra affärer av det. Jag tänkte inte berätta så mycket mer. Är det något du vill tillägga, Johanna? Nej, ingenting faktiskt. Utan det är väl det att du kommer att skicka ut... Vi kommer att skicka ut ett litet tack mail för att ni har varit med idag. Och då får ni det här produktbladet som beskriver programmet lite mer. Där finns kontaktpersonen till Emma då som kan svara på frågor och om det skulle vara något ni funderar över att anmäla och sådär. Så att eh, vi, vi skickar också ut eh, var ni hittar länken till den här inspelningen och var ni hittar presentationerna. Så det är väl det vi behöver säga, tror jag. Om, om det är så att man är intresserad av den här LTU-kursen så kan ni kontakta oss och vidareförmedla vi det till Luleå Tekniska Universitet. Mm. Jo, det är bra för att vår kurs handlar ju om en första introduktion och att man börjar ta steg i och tänka mycket affärsutveckling. Men det är klart att man är intresserad av att djupdyka lite mer i tekniken och då är det ju perfekt att vi har den här kompletteringskursen som faktiskt inte heller kostar någonting. Så det är ju riktigt, riktigt bra möjligheter för den som vill kliva in här. Ja, det återstår bara att visa sista bilden tror jag, Conny. Ja. Det vill säga tack. And I'll go back to English because I see that we still have our four speakers and presentations with us. So thanks again, everybody. Great that you took your time to spend with us. We, I did not see any questions in the chat, but um, I'm sure you have a lot. And please get back to us uh, if you have questions in the future. And I hope also to see some of you in our program. So it has been amazing and I have learned new things again, which I'm very grateful for. So thank you to everybody and see you next time. <laughs>